Well, even though I am the pastor of a Christian church, I have quite a few friends and acquaintances who live in the Saugatuck Douglas area who would define themselves as atheists or agnostics. And I have invited a few of them from time to time to come and check us out at Douglas UCC on Sunday and see what we're about. I've shared with some of them that we have a welcome sign in the foyer that says we are a community that welcomes believers and non-believers, agnostics and questioning skeptics. And I've shared with others that part of our church's mission statement is that we are a church that is more about the questions than the answers. <laughs> Well, that said, only one person has taken me up on that. <laughs> he came to worship with us a while back, and afterwards he said that while he was grateful for the warm welcome and the wonderful music and the positive message, that we were, in his words, a little too Jesus-y for him. <laughs> Another acquaintance of mine said that she was so wounded in the Christian church she grew up in that she could never step foot in a church even though she knows and respects me. Now, interestingly enough, this person practices yoga almost every day. And I said to her, what is it about yoga that you love so much? And she said, it makes me feel so centered. And I said, that's how I feel on Sunday morning. And I explained to her that yoga is an ancient Hindu word which means union with God. That's what yoga means. And I said to her, maybe the reason you feel so centered is because you're connecting with God. And she said, oh no, I don't believe in God. I don't believe that there is some old man up in the clouds that's watching my every move. And I said to her, I don't believe in that guy either. <laughs> and then I have another friend who posts really inspirational things on Facebook. He says things like, the universe has shaken you to awaken you. And the universe is always for you, never against you. And the universe is constantly communicating with us. And he just gave me a few weeks ago a new book, which is now on the New York Times bestseller list. And it's called, The Universe Has Your Back. And I said to him, that's God. And he said, no. <laughs> He said, I don't believe that I have to please some heavenly father in order to be rewarded. And that God is looking down and is going to punish me for wrongdoings. I don't believe in talking snakes and virgin births. And I said, I don't believe that stuff either. <laughs> You see, the thing is that I think that what my friend who practices yoga experiences and what my other friend calls the universe is what I experience and call God. The three of us really believe the same thing. We believe that there is a power working in the universe and working in us and through us. It's the same power, we just call it by different words. And words are important to people. The word God is not a positive word for a lot of people. People who have been wounded by the Christian church, the word God to them is negative. The word God is judgment and fear. It makes them uncomfortable. Then there are people who kind of roll their eyes at us. They think that what we do here on Sunday morning is nonsense, that it's ridiculous, that it's not grounded in reality. And a lot of reason for that is because a lot of people who are Christian still have a very childish 
concept of God. I've explained to you before, it's they look at God like Santa Claus. It's an old man with a white beard who lives up north and who sees you when you're sleeping and knows when you're awake and knows if you've been bad or good, so you better be good for goodness sake. That's how they view God, and that is ridiculous. So, we need to change our perception of God. Richard Rohr, who some of us are going to meet in a few weeks in New Mexico, asks this question of us. He says, what if changing your perception of God had the potential to change everything for you? What if changing your perception of God had the potential to change everything? I know that was true for me. Once I changed my perception of God, everything else made sense. Now, Bishop John Shelby Spong, we use his words every Sunday in our benediction. And Bishop Spong said this, I am quite certain that the reassessment of Christianity that I seek to develop must be so complete as to cause some people to fear that the God that they have traditionally worshipped is in fact dying. We face today a total change in the way modern people perceive reality. The way Christianity has traditionally been formulated no longer has credibility. And that's why we hear so many people today say they're spiritual, but not religious. Because for them, the Christian church in which they were raised is, like Bishop Spong says, not grounded in reality. It's not credible for them. We know so much more about how the universe and the world works than the biblical people did. We know through science that the world was not created in seven days and that we have evolved as a species. And yet there are still Christians in 2016 who want the biblical creation story taught in public schools rather than the scientifically proven evolution. Science and religion are not mutually exclusive. I love how the UCC ran that ad earlier this year that said, believe in science for God's sake. <laughs> <laughs> and in our words of integration this morning from Time Magazine, you see that what was beautifully written, it said that science and religion are just two sides of a coin. And both of them point to that deep human impulse we have to marvel at the cosmos and the meaning of life. And it says that, yes, we know exactly what happened a fraction of a second after the Big Bang. That's incredible. But what we don't know, what science can never prove is, why did life start? Why was the universe brought forth? We, as people of faith, believe that that why is God. That that why is the love that birthed everything, that breathed everything into life. Now, Jesus taught his followers, followers a prayer. We say it every Sunday, the Lord's Prayer. And in English, it begins, Our Father who art in heaven. But Jesus and his followers didn't speak English. They spoke Aramaic. And Aramaic scholars have translated that prayer into the Aramaic. And Jesus was not saying, Our Father who art in heaven. In Aramaic, Jesus was saying, Birther of the cosmos, whose light dwells within me. That's what that prayer is about. Jesus is saying, when we pray, we are connecting with that birther, that breath that brought forth everything that breathes us. That's why we focus on our breathing when we pray and meditate. We are connecting 
with that light that is within us. That is what yoga and meditation and prayer is, to align ourselves with that light. Now, when we talk about the universe, are we talking about God? Some have said that the birther of the universe became the universe, and that universe is within us. Now, Mike Valdez this morning, those wonderful words that he wrote, he spoke about two modern-day scientists. He quoted Carl Sagan and Neil deGrasse Tyson. Carl Sagan said, the entire cosmos is within us. We are made of star stuff. We are the way for the universe to know itself. Now, I don't want to discredit Carl Sagan, but 2,000 years before Carl Sagan, Jesus said the same exact thing. Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven is within you. You are the light of the world. You have star stuff. Jesus said, you are sons and daughters of God. You are made in God's image, the way for the universe to know itself. It's the same exact thing. And Neil deGrasse Tyson said this, when I look up at the night sky, I know that we're part of the universe and we're in the universe, but perhaps most important than both of these facts is that the universe is within us. This is true for dogs and bears and every living thing. We are, each of us, a little universe. In each of us is a little of all of us. In each of us is a little of all of us. We are one body. That's what science says, and that's what religion says. Modern science doesn't contradict the words of Jesus. In fact, modern science is supporting the words of Jesus. And it's not just the words of Jesus. In other faith traditions, we hear the same thing. Sufism is mystical Islam. And the Sufi writer Rumi said, the universe is not outside of you. Look within yourself. He wrote that in the 13th century. And Black Elk, the Native American spiritual teacher, said, at the center of the universe is where the great spirit dwells. And that center is within each one of us. These spiritual traditions are pointing to what modern science is now saying. It is the same wisdom. It's that wisdom that we heard about in our call to worship this morning, which is about that wisdom existed before anything else began. So, what are we doing here on Sundays? Well, what we're doing is we are celebrating each Sunday that mystery, that awe and wonder and beauty, and we are saying thank you, for we are a part of it. That's what we are doing here each Sunday. That, to me, is what worship is. Neil deGrasse Tyson said, when many people look up at the stars, they feel small because the universe is big. But when I look up at the stars, I feel big because my atoms come from those stars. Jesus knew that that power was within him 
and He said it's in us too. In the epistle this week, I shared a quote from the Christian writer Thomas Berry. He said, The universe is the primary sacred reality. We will recover our sense of the sacred only if we appreciate the universe. We become sacred by our participation in this sacred dimension. And Eckhart Tolle said, You are the universe expressing itself as human for a little while. You are the universe expressing itself as human for a little while. So, when we do as Mike Valdez instructed us this morning, tonight look up at the night sky and to contemplate the stars. Or when we see a beautiful sky at sunset, or a big round harvest moon, the reason we feel so connected is because we are one with that. That's why it brings us peace. That's why we feel such awe, is because that's God. And what's in the universe is within us. The birther of the universe became the universe, and the universe is within us. So what are we doing in prayer? God is in Santa Claus, so stop praying to Santa Claus. <laughs> if prayer for you is talking to an old man and asking things from him, or to give you things or fix things in your life, grow up. That's ridiculous. It's why people roll their eyes at Christians and think that what we do is ridiculous and why they won't walk in the front door on Sunday. Because that's what they think we're doing. Prayer is to get still. Prayer is to put ourselves in the flow of the universe. To remind ourselves that we are one with God. That the breath that breathes everything breathes us. That the light of the world is within us. That's what prayer is. It's to remind ourselves and to recognize that. And to align ourselves with it. Jesus aligned himself with it. And what did he do with it? He healed. And he worked miracles. And he said, whatever I did, you can do too. Now, it is hard to pray to the universe. I understand that. For some of us, we need a personification to pray to. And how fortunate are we to have Jesus? That's what Jesus was saying in today's gospel. You have me. I'm visible. I know that's kind of invisible, that mystery. But I'm it in human form. I'm the bread for you. I'm, I'm the material substance for you. So when you pray, you can visualize me. You can pray to me. I and the Father are one. So how beautiful that we have in prayer the person of Jesus to be the conduit for us, the way for us to connect with God who dwells within us. And so on this Creation Sunday, on this Universe Sunday, let us go forth and be people who marvel, people of awe and wonder, who look at the beauty of the universe and remember that that universe is within us, it's within our brothers and sisters, and it's within all of God's creation. Namaste.